how does a cinema camera, that's arguably one of the best cameras in the world, compare to an iPhone? Whoa, it went out of focus right away, okay. Little animals freaking out. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Nothing really makes me happier than working with a good camera. A camera that can capture the world accurately and beautifully, take what your eyes see and elevate it somehow. That's one of the best things out there, at least for me. In my left hand here, I have an iPhone X. I just got it yesterday. I've taken like one picture with it. <laughs> In my right hand, I'm holding an Epic W from Red. I just got this a few weeks ago. I shot one video with it. This is a Hollywood cinema camera. It is using the most cutting edge in sensor technology that RED has, their helium sensor. This is a cutting edge phone. It is the flagship device from Apple, the biggest phone manufacturer in the world. I'm curious, how does a cinema camera, that's arguably one of the best cameras in the world, compare to an iPhone? That's arguably one of the best phones in the world with one of the best cameras. Can you even tell the difference? I'm gonna run through a series of tests that I think define what makes a good camera, what makes a good image. So what are the qualities of a good camera? There's a whole range of things. So we're going to be testing a bunch of different things here, starting off with resolution. Resolution is how many pixels your image has. The more pixels, the more detail you can resolve. Also, if your image is really high resolution, you can actually crop into it, zoom into it without noticing any loss in detail. It's very, very useful for a filmmaker when they have to reframe and recompose their shots. The helium sensor is an 8K sensor, meaning horizontally there's 8,000 pixels in your image. That's a ton of pixels. The iPhone tops out at 4K. Horizontally, there's 4,000 pixels in the image. Still a ton of pixels. <laughs> Set the camera here. We're gonna zoom in on some details down the street on the computer. Uh, apparently this segment is brought to you by DHL. <laughs> I wonder how far we can zoom in. It's just a video clip of the street, guys. Pretty crazy. Next up, we're going to test dynamic range. Dynamic range is the range in light that your camera can capture before it completely clips out in the white or descends into noise in the shadows. The range between those two points, the wider it is, the wider your dynamic range. And generally speaking, the wider your dynamic range, the more forgiving your camera is and the more painterly your images look. Now, the way we're going to do this is I'm gonna have Bridger here stand in the doorway of this hallway where it's kind of dark. I'm going to expose for his face and it's bright daylight behind him. We're going to see if the camera can capture that. It might be blown out white, it might have all the color and detail. We'll see. Who doesn't love a good slow motion shot? Everybody loves a good slow motion shot. The thing is, when you're doing slow motion on a camera, your frame rate is much, much higher. Your camera is processing frames a lot faster and it's a lot more data for the system to handle. So shortcuts have to be taken. So we're gonna see what kind of shortcuts have been taken on the iPhone. Let you do 240 frames per second versus shortcuts on the red. So let you do 240 frames per second on that. And is there any visual difference? Which one looks better? We have a bunch of fireworks left over from the 360 wizard video. So we're gonna use them. Action. Good. <laughs> Got it. Hello there. It's time to test the low light capabilities of these cameras. But before we go into this test, I want to just briefly talk about some of the tech here. This camera probably has noise removal built into it, whereas this camera is capturing raw data and saving that raw data for you to then manipulate and post. So the way they're capturing low light is going to be a little bit different. This one's going to have some computer help happening, whereas this one, you would do that later on and post on the computer. So we are in a pretty dark room. It's only lit by two lights that are at like half brightness over there. And honestly, the technicalities of how much light is in this room doesn't really matter. So we're just comparing the cameras. So I'm gonna get a shot of Bridger sitting on that couch. Doesn't look too bad on the screen. I'm not gonna lie. So now we're going to do a codec test. A codec is how your camera is translating those photons hitting that sensor and giving off electrical signals into an image. It needs to store all that data somehow. It needs to translate that data into a presentable image that you can then work with. Different codecs have different qualities. Some of you have a lot of compression, which is to say that you can make a very small file size, just a couple megabytes of a very complicated image. But that comes with a trade-off. Parts of your image get thrown away because the codec has to assume which elements of data you want and which ones you don't. Some other codecs, like the one on this red camera, will capture much more data and much more information, but the file sizes are a lot bigger. Now, the way I like to do this is to stress test the codec by making each new frame new data that has to be written. Because a codec will compress your footage by looking at your frames and figuring out what doesn't change from frame to frame. And by just telling your computer or your phone or whatever your device is that's doing the decoding, saying, oh, this section of the background doesn't change between the frames, then it doesn't have to provide new data for that part of the frame. Then it makes your file size smaller. But if every frame is new, then it has to rewrite each frame. And if there's a data limit on that compression, then it's going to get blurry and blocky and it's not going to look very good. 
So the way I like to do this is to go outside where it's bright, raise the shutter speed really high so there's no motion blur, and just wiggle the camera really fast. And that makes each frame new. Coming up, we're gonna compare the footage that we just shot and see if you really could shoot a movie on your iPhone. <laughs> Science. Keeping things not, not distracting. We're talking about these Animojis. What's the story behind the Animojis? It's motion capture. The phone is using an infrared camera to pick up my facial features in 3D and apply it to a little animated emoji. Everyone's got facial motion capture in their pocket right now. And it's too good of an opportunity to pass up and not make a hilarious video with little animals freaking out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> How are you liking your iPhone X so far? They're great. All the hype is real. It's fast enough to run the latest operating system of Apple, which is uh, exactly why you buy a new phone. They keep making the operating system harder and harder to run, so you have to buy a better and better phone to run it. I haven't taken an actual picture with it yet. <laughs> your first picture? It like isolates things like that. Whoa. It just uses the infrared camera to isolate the environment a little bit. Look at that, just me. Oh God, that kind of looks like garbage actually. Yeah, we're trying to figure out how to, what to do for our Animoji video. People as animals as people. <laughs> you know? People with an animal head, pretending they're people but with animal habits. You go out to eat with friends and you all meet up at the cafe and everyone's like eating dog food just on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so it's time to look at the footage. Pair these shots. I brought in a guest witness. Everybody meet Sam. Hi, my name's Sam. I'm 31 years old and I like to uh, play guitar and deep dish pepperoni pizza. So we're gonna do a compression test here. So this is the red. As I whip that camera around really fast, left and right, back and forth, notice that if you look at the sign, you can still see all the detail of the little like cross hatching in the sign. None of that's getting lost. And all the detail in the wall, the ground, the marker paths. Perhaps zoom in with like the 300. Wow, look at all that detail. Look at all that detail. Like none of it's being, like you can see every single line on that sign. It's not breaking down at all. I do not see a single artifact or any squares or whatever. So here we are with the iPhone X. Static, looks great. Plenty of detail in the shot. I can see all the cross hatching on the sign. And away we go. Whoa, it went out of focus right away. Okay. Go back to like the second frame. The ground actually looks pretty good. I'm seeing some blurriness and blocking on the edge of the wall there. Okay, there we go. We, we snapped onto the sign for a second here. It's pretty much just a static shot, but notice all the detail on the sign, all those cross hatching, those little like squares on it, completely gone. Even though this frame doesn't have any blurring, like any motion blur, it's just a static frame. All of the fine detail, completely gone because the phone has a data limit as to how much detail it can put down for each frame. But here's another great example. Coming in, getting slower, getting slower, and as I slow down, it starts to be able to reuse data from each frame. So here, the sign, it's white, can't see any detail. Go a frame further, it's starting to crispen up a little bit. I go a frame further, and now you can see all the cross hatching on it again. But that means that if you're getting a really high action shot, like let's say you're filming confetti, that means that as a confetti starts moving and your frame gets all crazy and each new frame needs to be new data, it's going to start to get blurry and you're not gonna get anywhere near that 4K resolution that you've been promised. All right, let's take a look at the dynamic range here. So here's Bridger hanging out, giving us a wave and the camera's currently exposed for his face here. In the background, it's pretty bright. Let's take a look at how much data we actually have in the background there. I'm just gonna pull down the ISO, pull down the exposure here. All right, so looking at this background here, we can see that the clouds are clipped a little bit. There's a part where it just is a flat white that kind of turns into a gray, but there's plenty of blue in that sky, plenty of data there. I can see the entire building behind him. So all that is being captured. And using color grading, you could pull that in, work with it. But this is how it looked when I captured it. All right, let's take a look at the iPhone. Oh God, that's pretty gnarly. Now it's worth noting, there's differences in saturation here. The iPhone is handling the image and processing it a little bit differently. All right, so flipping back and forth between them, I see one noticeable difference outside of the color, ignoring the color shift for a second. It looks like a white cloud has appeared right above the building. If you flip back to the other frame, there is no white cloud there. That is not a white cloud. It is simply the sensor clipping out. It's because the sky has gotten so bright there that any sort of signal that the sensor on the phone is getting is just pure clipped out at full signal, which gets interpreted as white. Whereas in the red, there's still blue sky there. Shadow wise, they're capturing about the same amount of detail, but in the highlights, clearly there's more data being captured on the red. Beyond that highlight retention though, it doesn't look that bad. It's capturing a lot of good color in the background and Bridger himself looks pretty well exposed and has a lot of good detail in him. All right, resolution. I expect this to not be a contest. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna blow it up. All right, I'm gonna get real zoomed in here. Yeah, I, would, I would say this is a little unfair. It's like right now the iPhone appears to have just a little more detail, but that's probably due to sharpening. Now I would say that if you kind of made red footage a little more contrasty and sharpened it. I can do that, I can do that right now. So now if we flip back and forth, not quite perfectly lined up. At first glance, they actually seem pretty close. Like looking at the front of the car here, compared to here, it looks almost identical, but I start to see some differences. Look at the bricks on this peach colored building. 
On the red, I can see every single line of bricks. On the phone, it's a mush. Same with the road. It's all just kind of mush here as the compression kind of takes out the detail that it doesn't think you're gonna see. On the red, I can see all the pebbles and the rocks. And granted, we're super zoomed in, so it's kind of fuzzy, but all that detail's still there. Really, not as big of a difference as I would have expected. And perceptively, like once you zoom out a little bit, probably can't really tell the difference too much between the two. But I can read stop on the stop sign in the red, and I can't read it on the phone. There, I think that's the best example right there. Yeah. All right, slow motion time. Whoa. I predict that these are actually gonna look very similar. All right, so here we are with some slow motion from the iPhone. Wowzers. Wow, wait. There's a 240 frames per second. That's pretty slow. There's a bit of a shimmer to the image. You can see it here, like on the pebbles here on the ground. See, they kind of shift and shimmer, like they pop up and down by a pixel at a time. Um, you can see it in the par lines too. See how they kind of shift and shimmer there? A little bit of aliasing. iPhone can't read all pixels off that sensor at 240 frames per second. It's skipping pixels. And what you get with that is you get a bit of aliasing in moiré. I don't know. Is it moiré? Moiré. 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 Like a film noir. You get this flickering effect. All right, here's the red. Ah, uh, yes. Look how much softer and gentler this image looks. <laughs> so crisp and so high quality. That guy is slow motion to look good. That guy's a little nervous that you guys are doing camera <laughs> tests. But look how much better this looks. The, look at the, the insane, the, yeah. the insane amount of dynamic range that we're still getting here with like the flame and the fire and all that stuff. Like obviously it's higher on the red, but I'm pretty sure they're sacrificing a little bit of that dynamic range to get more <laughs> frames in there. There's no shimmer. If I go back and forth in frames, there's no shimmer on the ground. I do actually see heat ripples, which is actually another testament to the codec. Those heat ripples will be lost because the movement would be so small that it would get disregarded when being compressed on the iPhone. Yeah. But once again, this phone's doing 240 frames per second. It's pretty dang good for I mean, a phone. <laughs> test number two, the test that matters. This is a moment. test that unites kingdoms and makes them fall apart. That's the alien signal we received. We received an odd transmission. <laughs> Same thing on the red. Looks like I'm actually a little out of focus on you. So interesting thing here is because I'm so cropped in on the sensor on the red, it's hard to pull focus, whereas it's a lot easier to pull focus on the phone. So in a way, when it comes to slow motion, both these cameras are actually doing a pretty decent job of it, and the iPhone has its strengths here. Like, it's a little bit easier to use, it's a little bit wider angle. Yeah, sure, the image gets a little chunky, but the red image is a little chunky too in its own way. So, Nico. Would any of these advantages lead you to use an iPhone instead of a RED on a film set? No, but I probably actually wouldn't use either of these cameras for doing 240 frames per second. I'd actually probably go back to our Dragon. For Why the Dragon? The Dragon, when you crop into 2K to do slow motion, doesn't crop in on the sensor as far. All right, finally, low light. In the past, REDs actually haven't had very good low light sensitivity. The Helium is the first RED sensor to actually have some oomph in that realm of low light. So here we are at 6400 ISO. Bridger, relaxing. And there is some grain. That's, that's the whole point here is to push the camera to the point of starting to get some grain. It doesn't look too bad for how dark the room was. Rolling. And here's the iPhone. Yeah. Roughly same brightness. Gross. Perceptively. But once again, compared to old iPhones, much better. And it was actually really dark. But I'm actually pretty impressed with the red here. That looks pretty dang good for being low light. Ooh. Looking at the edge of the couch here in the wall, this is the red. And I'm gonna do the same thing here. It's kind of same spot here, couch in the wall. So the grain size, like the grain is there on the red. It's definitely wow. present. And then here's the grain on the iPhone coming up here. It's a little more pronounced than the iPhone. And when you have the red file at 8,000 pixels horizontal, that noise, that grain becomes very fine and becomes much less perceptible. That's where resolution has a bit of an advantage for low light. The red is definitely utilizing that advantage here to give us a cleaner low light frame. It looks good. pretty dang good. I'm not gonna lie. I know it's not a cinema camera, but it looks freaking great. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm shooting video with my phone, I don't really want to have to color grade it and color correct it and do all that kind of stuff. Overall, the cinema camera obviously still has its perks. Cinema cameras have obviously gotten better and better to the point now where they have much more dynamic range and much more resolution than film. And these cameras built into our phones are starting to approach that point. I would say the iPhone X is better than every camera I used up until 2011. Three years, four years, who knows? Maybe in that short amount of time we'll have phones that capture video quality at the same quality as our very first Scarlet. We'll see. Hey guys, just a little something off topic from the video here. In another video, I showed off my finished Settlers of Catan set that I 3D printed. And I asked everybody what I should use to spray it to protect the paint because all the other matte finishes I tried were too shiny. And everybody recommended Testor's Dull Coat. 
and it worked out great. I just want to thank you guys for helping me out, suggesting what I should use. It worked like a charm. My katan set is truly finished with your help. <laughs>